Welcome back to the Japan Archives. How have you been, Heather? Oh, I'm having a lovely time with the Cofoon Show. It's doing, doing lovely, having a great time. Let me move my microphone closer to my face. Oh, look, that's... That sounds so much nicer now. Hello. I was so busy trying to not scratch my eyes, I wasn't paying any attention to my microphone. <laughs> How are you, Thomas? Yeah, pretty good. Some not summer school. It's not summer. Spring <laughs> school is nearly over now. I ordered something to try and improve the audio for my new setup here. It's a little bit echoey because I'm in a much bigger room now, but I kind of bought like a screen that I can set up behind me for the future episodes, so maybe the echo will lessen a little bit. But now everything's going good. But for today's episode, um I found another tale, this time about a monk, a monk known as Zolga. And he lived, so this guy lived from 917 to 1003 AD. So again, we're in the Heian period. Uh, This story as well, like the, the story about the troubled stomachs of those poor people. Uh, This story also comes from the Konjaku Monogatari Shu, uh, that collection you know of anonymous like we don't know the author so the anonymous tales so i want to read this one today it's well i like the story so so you you looked at this one before you read it you're reading it i had a little read before you joined the call there is some there's a bit of hilarity in this one as well. I don't know if it's the theme from this these tales. So I'm just going to read it and you can let me know what you think afterwards. <laughs> oh I'm looking forward to this again. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so this is a tale from the life of priest, well, monk Zoga. So the story goes, the renowned monk Zoga was born in Kyoto, but his parents soon moved to the east. They built for the journey a sort of palakin, which they mounted on a horse and installed in it a wet nurse with their little son in her arms. Unfortunately, it was a long journey and the wet nurse fell asleep and dropped the baby. And little Zoga tumbled to the ground and rolled away. Nearly a mile further on, the wet nurse woke up and realized the baby had fallen out, though goodness knew where the baby was at this point. The news drove Zoga's parents mad. They ranted and raved about all, how all the passing horses, oxen, and people must have trampled him to death, but they turned back anyway since they still wanted his poor body. They found the baby on his back in the middle of the narrow trail, smiling happily. There was not a spot of mud or a wet patch upon him. It was a miracle. That night Zoga's parents had a dream. A sumptuous couch spread with a costly coverlet rode on an expanse of mud, and on it lay little Zoga. Four exquisite boys, one at each corner of the couch, chanted in a language of the scriptures. This child is born from the Buddha's mouth. Wherefore we keep him from all harm. Now Zoga's parents knew their son was unusual, and they raised him tenderly. By the time he reached the age of five, little Zoga announced that he would soon be going to master the Lotus Sutra on Mount Hiei. His parents thought him much too young to be saying things like that and feared some spirit might be talking through him. But soon his mother dreamed that even as she nursed her boy, he grew into a mature monk with a sutra scroll in his hand. And besides him stood another monk, who explained that it was her son's destiny to enter into religion. And so his parents stopped opposing their son's plans and decided to be happy for him instead. And so by the age of 11, Zoga found a distinguished master upon the mountain. After a few years, everyone recognized his piety and learning. He caused quite a stir, though, when he came back stark naked from the Issei shrine, having been inspired by a dream. A voice had told him in the dream, forget the body. And so he had been inspired to take off all his clothes and pass them out to the beggars he passed. People thought he was mad. And though his master more or less understood the reasoning behind this, he felt obliged to remind Zoga that the wish to transcend worldly ambition 
did not necessarily exempt him from behaving normally. Another time, when his master had just been promoted to the highest ecclesiastical rank, Zoga joined the triumphal procession mounted on a bony old ox with a dried salmon at his waist instead of a sword. Respectability and success really meant nothing to Zoga, who wanted above all a quieter place to live. Wanting this quiet place, he chose Tonomine in the hills south of Nara. However, the abbot refused to let him leave, although he then quickly managed to change the abbot's mind. He stopped sending a servant to fetch his meals, but instead came with a blackened and filthy sort of box to collect them himself. Then he would squat by the path with the workmen, pick up a couple of twigs for chopsticks, and share out his dinner as he ate it. People decided he was crazy, and so the abbot was glad to be rid of him and let him go live where he wished. Zoga then found the top of the mountain at Tonomine too thick with the demons that hindered enlightenment, and instead built a hut at the inconspicuous spot down in the valley. Alas, he had become so revered by now that the emperor insisted on naming him to be his personal staff of healers, and naturally other great nobles demanded his service as well. Zoga generally ignored all these calls, but when he did go, he behaved like a madman and got out of the capital as fast as he could. There was, for example, the Empress's ordination. Planning to retire into the religious life, the Sanjo Empress invited Zoga to preside at the ceremony. Her messenger thought that this was a fine idea, since such a holy man would no doubt make the Empress into a properly worthy nun. Zoga's disciples assumed their master would fly into a rage and perhaps even beat the messenger but he did nothing of the sort. He accompanied the messenger instead back to the empress's palace without even a murmur of complaint. All sorts of nobles and monks had gathered for the right. There was even someone who represented the emperor there. They all noted Zoga's fierce eyes and impressive bearing, but thought he seemed a little unwell. Zoga went right to the empress's curtains and started the ceremony. At the appropriate moment, the empress put her long, beautiful hair out through the curtains, and Zoga, in a gesture which above all divides the worldly from the religious life, cut off her hair. Within the curtains, the empress's ladies weeped as though their hearts would break. Having done his bit, Zoga tidied up, then addressed the empress in ringing tones, what did you want me for anyway, he complained. I don't really understand. Did you hear I had a big penis or something? Well, yes, it's bigger than most, but right now it's as limp as silk floss. All over the rooms, eyes popped and jaws dropped. Who knew how the Empress felt? It was unbelievable. The holy aura was gone, and the speechless assembly broke out instead into a cold sweat. Zoga's farewell then followed. I'm an old man, you know, he went on. My insides don't work, and I've got terrible diarrhea so bad all the time that I shouldn't have come here at all. But the honor was just too tempting, I suppose. But now you understand, I cannot hold it in any longer. I'm begging your pardon, I've just got to let it out. And so he squatted on the veranda, tucked up his skirts, and let it all out. The noise was revolting and the stench a horror. Both hit the empress full force. The younger courtiers went into convulsions of laughter, while the monks muttered to each other that Her Majesty was crazy herself to have called in such a lunatic. But nothing Zoga could do seemed to tarnish his unwanted fame. He was past eighty, as sound as ever in body and spirit, when he understood he was to die in ten days. At last I'll have what I've always prayed for, he exclaimed. Soon I'll leave this world behind and be reborn in paradise. He had his disciples write verses on going to paradise and cheerfully made up one himself from a classical paradox. Eighty years of patience, with age slowly wrinkling me into an old man. What a joy at last to find the jellyfish's bones. 
Zolga announced the great day himself. While he called for a go board, his disciples brought him one from next door, assuming he wanted to put the Buddha on it. But no, he demanded to be propped up, and in a weak voice invited a close friend to play. The friend was shocked and saddened at the time like this, when Zolga should have been calling on Lord Amida and looking forward to his welcome. He was thinking of such foolishness instead. Why, he must be out of his mind. But Zoga was so eminent that the friend dare not disobey. He sat down at the board, and he and Zoga each placed their first ten stones. All right, he said, no more, and swept the stones from the board. Why did you want to play Go? the friend asked timidly. I've watched people play it ever since I was a boy, and as I was calling the name just now, I wanted to try it. Now Zoga demanded to be propped up again. Get me a pair of stirrup guards, he commanded, meaning the leather guards that protect a rider's feet. When they came, he had them tied together and hung around his neck. Then he opened his arms wide, though it was clearly painful for him to do so, and announced he would dance. After doing a little dance, he then had the items removed. When I first was upon the mountain, he explained, a bunch of young monks lived next door, and they had a very good time. Once I saw one hang a pair of stirrup guards around his neck and dance to the tune of a clever song which I suppose he'd just made up. It really tickled me when I saw it. I'd forgotten all about it, but the memory came back just now, and I felt like I wanted to try it. That's all. I've nothing more on my mind now. And so he then sent everyone away and retired to his inner room, where he sat in a crude chair facing west and chanted the Lotus Sutra until he passed away. And there's the strange tale of the life of Zoga. What's this book again? <laughs> it's uh, the Konjaku Monogatari Shu, or the Anthology of Tales from the Past. It's a collection, it's a collection of tales. I'm sensing a, th a, th a slight theme in these tales, perhaps the, the two we've had. <laughs> My goodness. I think we have read one or two from here before, but I don't, I mean, like we commented last, ep not last, last episode, it was the first time we seem to have had comedy in a story. Mm, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Here's another one popping in. Oh my goodness. Well, that was, you know, it's interesting though, the very beginning reminded me of that movie, uh, was it Kung Pao? Did you ever see that? Mm. Right. I the don't think so. Oh my goodness. It's it it's it's ridiculous it's great it's really it's it was as you know it's kind of older now so i'm i'm assuming the humor still i'm not sure but it was in the opening scenes is him rolling down as a baby rolling down a hill oh right <laughs> so that that was i you, i should have known the story was going to go somewhere interesting should have should have picked up on that big broad hint at the beginning <laughs> so what did you think when you first you first skimmed it i mean when i was first reading through it i was like okay this is definitely gonna have some interesting things like those buddhist tales always seem to have protected by buddha you visit hell you have these dreams and things i was like okay it's going to be interesting and it was interesting i wasn't counting on him trying to convince everyone that he was a lunatic and then everyone thought he was a lunatic but somehow it made him more revered even though at the same time everyone thought that he is a madman <laughs> i feel like there's um yeah there's something to be said there i but um I'm not sure of the lesson, but I do find that fascinating. Well, how did you pick this? Because you, you, did you pick this story based on the title or did you, because you, you hadn't read it before until kind of about just recently. I hadn't recently. read it before. I picked it based off the title the book used for it because I was intrigued. And then after I read it, I mean, it's it's my, my name right now in the recording. The, the yeah. name of the book story they chose for this was The Jellyfish's Bone. So 
I was intrigued to see where this was going. And then it was kind of just a one-off line in his paradoxical verse at the end of his life. So the name drew me in, even if it wasn't necessarily that important in the end after I read it. But I'm still glad I read it because it was very bizarre and quite funny, especially when he did what he did after helping the Sanjo Empress become a nun. <laughs> Gosh. I mean, yeah, like woman. just saying so I'm like, why did you ask for me? Is it because you've you've heard rumors about the size of my penis? Like, okay. It's not and expected. By the way, it. I need to go to the bathroom. I mean, refreshing to have some honesty there. Very plain spoken. For sure. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm honestly I'm, I'm really glad you you pick something like this just because after the one from last week, I'm I'm enjoying. <laughs> yeah, we needed something lighter for sure. Yes, light light is delightful. <laughs> I wasn't meaning to make that rhyme, but it did. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. Still, I'm still a little stunned. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it. Thank you for finding that and and reading that. Oh, that is. That was my pleasure. I'm glad I stumbled across it. Oh, goodness. I'm still processing. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> so, yeah, that was my tale about the strange priest, Zorga. For those of you listening at home, I hope you enjoyed. But I enjoyed it, and I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I hope, I hope we do keep finding more comedic tales as well now. It's nice to see... I think like we said in the last comedic episode, it's nice to see that they actually have this style of tale. Yes, yes. It's, it's nice. It's refreshing. Yeah. But I am now intrigued to see what is over in Sumiko no Heather today. Today we have a phrase. Okay. Mm. And I feel like you have heard this before just, oh, no okay. uh, no i and you <laughs> yeah, you'll get this one you'll get this one. i have every faith and confidence uh it's only like three words so <laughs> it's fine I, I i think you get it i think you get it it is hana yori dango hana yori dango uh-huh flower night dango yori the oh yori mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so probably... the other two are correct. Yeah, hana yori dango. Remember your, your remember your Japanese grammar from like back in the day when you were studying. It's um not a con it's like a, sort of like a conjunction type word. I know I know you know it. I know you know it. And you're gonna go, oh yeah, I know that when I tell you because you're gonna I know you know it. I'm like two hundred and thirty six percent sure I don't know it. <laughs> oh man i i see i still think you do i think it's buried in the depths of your mind and you'll when i tell you um but anyway so you've got you, you got the two words uh hanan dango what at uh, those what are those please oh hana can be nose or flower but i'm assuming in this one is flower and dango dango is like a gelatinous rice like mochi kind of thing i'm really enjoying right now and i'm so glad my supermarket has it the mitarashi dango oh yes that's oh so my good. goodness that's super so good super good and i went to a Wayno park at the weekend with my partner and to see the cherry blossom beams and they had like a pop-up stand for dango and stuff and they had super big Meat terashi dango, and oh, it was so tasty. The ones where it was like like over the fire, like the ones sticking up and no, they didn't have the ones over the fire, which was a shame. But if you come to Japan and you ever see meat terashi dango, please buy it. It's delicious. I don't know why I sang that, but I did because it's that good. It's you're it's right. So good, it just good. brings you out in song. <laughs> You know, it often does when I when I get it at the store. 
cashiers look at me very strangely. Um, so yes, you are correct on You're both just terms. Like, I would like to buy Midashi Dango. And they're like, oh no, this crazy foreigner is here again. Please, <laughs> please take the please take the Midashi Dango and leave. You don't have to pay. Just please leave my shop. <laughs> It's like, okay, thank you. Goodbye. Please go away. Thank you, goodbye. See you hopefully never again. <laughs> Are maybe entertaining? You never know. You never know. Maybe it's all right. <laughs> now I'm thinking about Dango. What were you doing? Oh, yes, we're talking about stuff. Hanayori Dango. The... Oh, yes, we were. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, what does, so, what does Yori mean? Yori, see, now I'm going to have to explain grammar, and this is really, I should have. Oh man, see, I knew before I did this, I should have refreshed by looking at my book. But the meaning is dango, like before or instead of flowers. So it is a saying that says substance over like the aesthetic. So preferring to eat dango instead of like looking at flowers. And there's the reason I picked this one is because right now it is Hanami season. The sakura are, I think the they just had the full bloom, so we're kind of going on the the downward, going toward the green leaves uh, portion of the of the flower show. But Hanami is to have a picnic underneath the blooming cherry trees, and. The saying means that instead of sitting and looking at the beautiful flowers, people are eating the food. So it's to have the appreciation for something that's practical versus just like, you know, artistic or aesthetic. But it's not this, but it makes me think of mind over matter. Ah, yeah. It's the other way, matter over mind, like substance over emotion substance over like the the earthy versus the high-minded like your, yeah. your your stomach versus your imagination for example and like in a subtle way it's like get your priority sword first then you can enjoy what's surrounding you food mm. first viewing later when you can just lay back and relax and enjoy it you can't enjoy it as much if you suddenly feel hungry and have you have to go away from it. That is true. You've got to mm. meet your your baselines before you can go to the next level. You've got to do the. Hmm. I really enjoy the the way you put that. Thank you. That's what I I like this one because it's incredibly short, but the meaning is 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 a little deeper than I was expecting. Yeah. If you are familiar at all with that, like Japanese anime, there was a show, this is an older one, like Hanayori Dango, which the English translation title is Boys Over Flowers, as opposed to, you know, Boys the... Boys Over Flowers, wasn't that like a, that was also an anime? I'm pretty sure when I was younger, there was an anime called Boys Over Flowers. I think, yeah, you're remembering the one that... Um... Uh, so do you think that you are a hana person or a dango person give me the dango <laughs> okay i'm with you on that too, actually like yeah I'm, i'll be in line behind you can you the dango if i do because i just went to see the cherry blossom so if i'd have been walking around ueno park hungry i would have enjoyed it less I want to be able to just go there and enjoy the the feeling and the viewing of it. I don't want to go thinking, I need to figure out where I'm going to eat after this because I'm so hungry. Like, I just want to go and enjoy the moment, right? <laughs> this is true. You're like, these are beautiful flowers. I'm so hungry. I can't focus on them anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, especially if it's Midorashi Dango. I mean, oh, even the, the, the tricolored Dango is also really good. Hmm. Ooh, or have you had the one with the um, red beans on top? I have a lot of traditional Japanese stuff with my new partner. Very traditional. Well, he's Japanese, so it makes sense. Sometimes I lose track of all the stuff we've tried. 
you you've got to remember what you try because I need to like see that if I'm missing out on something I got I gotta I gotta taste it gotta try it because there's a bunch of stuff that we miss out plus it's a lot of things are sometimes regional so if you're not from that region you might not necessarily know about it yeah that's true and even the same dish yes can be very different the new year soup for example he was telling me mitarashi dango in tokyo is very different to it in nagoya it has a stronger taste in nagoya that yeah that would make sense because the i think udon too and mm. soba are different in osaka versus tokyo and then yeah. hiroshima Udon is a lot of it is the, the Sanuki because it's close to Shikoku, but different flavors as well. Yeah. So it would make sense that Nagoya would have something different. Ooh. Ooh. I'll go try it this weekend. <laughs> I will be there. I think we definitely have proved <laughs> that perhaps we we are definitely Dango, Dango people. We are Dango and not flowers. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for that. It was very interesting. Something new to think about. And so, everyone, thank you for tuning in this week. I hope you enjoyed the tale. I definitely did. And I hope you enjoyed the phrase. Let us know if you're a flower or a dango. I'd be intrigued to know. But yeah, as usual, you can find the website historyofjapan.co.uk. We're always adding new articles on there every month now. We've been managing to do it consistently. For the last four months so we're very happy about that so yeah until next week a quick choice for heather next week do you want to continue shinto mythology and bring us closer to matching up with jimo's jimu's first reign or shall i find something historical i really want something historical all okay? right okay. historical it is then i'll just yeah. try not to find something like today <laughs> If if it happens to come to us, then it was meant to be. <laughs> it was meant to be. All right. Well, again, thank you everyone for tuning in this week. Until next time, matane. Mata ne.